Does anyone else want to get better at Dune Spice Wars? Well, I got good news for you because we're doing something different today. We are going to do a tips and tricks video, right? I tried making a, I tried making a how to play Dune video and um, it was like 15 hours long and it didn't work at all. So you're going to have to figure out how to play on your own, but I'll tell you some cool stuff to think about, some tips, some things to keep in mind, some stuff that'll help you be a better player. I think I've got 20 of these, 10 basic, 10 advanced, but I mixed up the numbers, but d don't worry about it, the numbers aren't important, listen to the words. Number one, basic tips. Mind your upkeep. Um, biggest mistake new players make is having a weak economy because they're just building buildings for the fun of it. The most important things to be aware of are the buildings you probably most want to build, the likes of Plazcrete factories, recruitment offices, research hubs. They're very expensive. You know, if you mouse over your Plazcrete factory, so be aware of where your trade is right here. So we've got a, an inbuilt 10% Solari upkeep. But uh, in general, your Plazcrete factory for everyone costs about 20 Solari a day to upkeep. And in a normal region, it's only making you 10 Plazcrete. 20 a day is a lot. Your recruitment office costs 20 a day and only gives you three manpower a day. The likes of your research hub costs 15 or 16 or so and only gives you one knowledge. It's real, real easy to say, oh, I need some more Plascrete, I'll build two more Plascrete factories without sort of internalizing that you're spending an extra 40 Solari a day, which is a, a significant chunk. Also, combo that with the fact that a lot of your income comes from spice, and the spice market fluctuates up and down. If you build a bunch when the spice market is up, the next time the spice market goes down, you're going to sink into the red, and suddenly you're going to be trying to figure out what's what. Be very careful about the buildings that you do. Be very mindful. It's probably better to wait a little bit and hold off on investing in new stuff until you have a stronger economy, until you've got the game sense to know, you know, what a stronger economy feels like until you can see, all right, I'm about to go take this rare region down here. That'll give me more money. I can afford to invest in more stuff back home. Don't just build buildings because you got space for them. Be thoughtful about it. Number two, neutral aggro. A, a small thing, but important to be aware of, especially when fighting neutral villages. When you attack a neutral village, everyone in the village will target the first, per the closest person to them when they spawn. If you want them to target different stuff, you gotta take the guy who's being attacked and run him away. If he's running away, the melee guys will move quickly, but you'll see the ranged guys will still be focused on their initial target. And it'll take them a while to get off of them. So if you really want them off of the guy they're shooting, you tie up the ranged units with a melee unit and that immediately switches their aggro over to the other unit. You oftentimes, the Atreides are so tanky they hardly care anymore, but many factions do care and you need to be able to balance and bounce the aggro from the neutrals around a little bit. So be aware that there's there's some shenanigans you could play. You could, if you if a unit gets weak, you can pull him out and move things around to make sure that they're attacking your strong units so that you don't lose anyone. You never want some some militia in a backwater village to be killing your crack troops. So keep an eye on that sort of thing. Number eight, the humble thopter. What do you do after you've got all the map explored and you've got all kinds of thopters following your harvesters around, making sure they're in safe mode, not getting eaten? If they're sitting at your base on uh, auto recon, they will fly out and they will examine any points of interest that show up on the map. But probably even more, you kind of want one doing that. I'll give you one. But more importantly is you want them looking at other stuff on the map. You should be aware that the map is actually divided into little chunks. So you can see here is a whole region, but with a thopter here, nearby, I can see this chunk of the region. And if I fly my thopter down another chunk, boom, it opens up the chunks around it here. So one thing you could do, and I strongly recommend, send some thopters out into the uninhabited regions, the likes of the deep desert where people aren't going to come out and mess with them unless they really, really need to. So just by having a thopter out here in the desert, off of auto recon so he doesn't fly away, I can keep an eye on what the smugglers are doing here. If they want to send an army up to go pillage things, if they want to walk towards me to cause some trouble, I can see it coming a long ways away. A thopter only has an upkeep of five solari a day, which is quite a deal for vision. 
Also, it's a great idea not just for your neighbors, but you usually lack in um, some some vision on what's going on on the other side of the map. You, you know, you need that kind of information. Are the smugglers and the Fremen battling? Are the Fremen and the Vernius battling? You know, are the Fremen just sitting back and expanding? The only way to really know that is to go look. So it's definitely a good idea, especially as you get towards the end game, to have a few yes, th extra thopters out and about, sitting in the deserts. And likewise, remember, because this stuff is in okay. chunks, you Let's could kind of even have them okay. a little go. bit deep set in the desert wander. here and still get that vision of those surrounding chunks. You know, no one's going to wander out in the desert just to try to shoot at your thopter to get rid of it, as much as they might like it gone. Um, number three, the versatile thumper. We are talking the decoy thumper. Do I have it prepped here? Yes, the decoy thumper in the operations. This requires two guys on a rack, level two for Arrakis, 200 intel, 200 money. And the reason the thumper is so versatile is because it does a lot of things. It summons a sandworm to this region, and it protects neighboring regions from sandworms. So when would you use a thumper? If we pop it up here, you can see there's the red uh, the red effect. It lasts for three days, and this region has the red effect of the thumper. And you can see the adjacent regions have the green effect of the thumper, saying a nearby deco decoy thumper prevents sandworm attacks in the region. So, in theory, I can take this guy while this thumper is active, and we can go wander around the deep desert out here, a place that is likely to have pretty rapid worm strikes if you just go walking through it. We're just wandering around the desert, no worms. No worms eating me because the thumper up there is keeping this place safe. You can use this if a worm is about to hit your guys. If you're fast enough, you can throw a thumper in the neighboring region and it, it, the worm won't eat your men that are doing whatever they're doing over here. You can use thumpers as a defensive tactic. Maybe the smugglers are walking an army in through this region and I'm not ready for them. I pop a thumper here and he needs to decide if he's going to keep walking through this region with worms being called to it, highly likely to get worm struck or if he's going to turn around and go back and wait out a couple days before he could try again. Super powerful. If you are fighting up on the rocks and the guys that are coming to attack you, maybe it's a lot of snipers and they're going to try and shoot you and back off and shoot you and back off, you could pop a thumper on the sand and they're not going to want to stand on the sand. They're going to have to get on the rocks and stand still and fight you. They, they, they can't afford to try to kite you through the desert if there's a thumper calling worms nearby. Thumpers are great. You should almost always have a thumper ready just because there's a lot of good things that it can do. Number four, play the market. Adjust your rates. Be aware that the Chom market here fluctuates up and down from about a 1.5 to a 2.5. Um, I think that's true. What is it at now? Is that 1.6? Yeah, that's about right. Maybe it's even lower. Is it properly 1.4 now? Oh no, it's because someone put the minus spice exchange rate on me. Ignore that part. Anyways, it fluctuates up and down from 1.5 to 2.5 or thereabouts. So be aware that if you get early game a 2.0 rate in your spice market, that's about average. That's a good time to, uh, to tick this bar down and say that you're selling more, getting some more return. When the imperial tax is paid, once this circle fills up and you pay your taxes, the, ch the spice rate will change and it'll be something different. And if it's lousy, if it's under two probably, or something, something else bad, you might want to be able to uh, stockpile more of your tax, more of your, th your spice so that you could sell it when there's a better rate. That's obvious, right? This is extra important to be understanding the rates when you do something like build the very valuable Chome Branch. The Chome Branch is the main base building that says plus 0.8 to exchange rate when the base exchange rate is at least 2.2. So if you go and build the Chome Branch, and you probably should be, you then really want to keep a close eye. So if it ever hits a base rate of 2.2, it will jump way up to 3 plus after that. Now things also get a little funny because you have imperial satisfaction. Most houses, if they're paying their spice tax, get a small incremental update. But one thing you can do is you can mouse over the imperial tax over here, and it'll tell you the spice exchange rate at the bottom. It'll sell you base exchange rate. So right now, the base exchange rate for spice is 2.3 and know that I've got the Chome integration development, which says I can see the next period's spice exchange rate as well. So it says, it's actually, it's, it's labeled kind of funny. It says base exchange rate pre-visions. 
Previsions is their way there. I think they're a French developer. Maybe maybe it's the French way of saying the next upcoming Spice tax, right? It is currently paying 2.3 the next time that we pay tax the rate will go up to 2.4 is what this says So you can kind of look at that and say oh, I should be selling now. I should be stockpiling now Make sure you're paying you're making it a habit to pay attention to this and keep this going up and down and never ever ever miss an imperial tax unless you are an expert and know exactly why you are missing that tax. Um, number six, don't cap your resources. Your money basically has an infinite cap. You always want more money. Plascrete has a 5,000 cap. And really, once you start getting up into the two or the three thousands, that means you're not really using a whole lot of Plascrete and it's, it's banking up. The important thing to note there is that Plascrete doesn't have a lot of extra uses. If you've got your villages built out, if you are banking it up, you don't need more Plascrete, and like we talked about earlier, your Plascrete factories are very expensive to upkeep. Upkeep. If your Plascrete starts filling up, you want to go back through and you want to demolish buildings. Get rid of those Plascrete factories, put something else in there, or put nothing in there. Just the fact that you're not paying upkeep for something that's not giving you any benefit can be a big economic boon. That's usually more of a late game sort of consideration, but it's definitely an important economic one to think about. The likes of manpower, um, this caps out at 300 or 600 if you've got a recruitment center built. Now manpower is interesting because you don't need it until you need it, right? It is very likely that you'll be capped in manpower for a long time, but if you get in a war and you're suddenly you're making troops at 40 manpower a time, maybe your whole army gets wiped out, you got to build another army, that army gets wiped out, you got to build another army, and suddenly you're out of manpower, right? That's worst case scenario. You run out of manpower when you're in the midst of the war, you just lost that war. So the typical uh, the typical, typical number I would recommend is a 20 plus is, is a pretty good manpower number to have. But you can do some things. You could still say when your manpower is capped out, make sure you've got guys manning your harvesters. Make sure your your militia villages, or the militia in your villages are all upgraded to heavy militias. Things you can make sure to spend on. And early game, sometimes you can get away with less manpower. Late game, you like to have that extra buffer. Likewise with fuel cells, you don't need regions with fuel cell factories, you know, if you've got 10 or 20 fuel cells, you're probably meeting your needs. If you're making 60 fuel cells, uh, you're not probably going to do anything with 40 of them. So why are you making 60 in the first place? Um, it's a little different if you have opted for the geothermal condensers, in which case they kind of pay for themselves and give you a little bit of a benefit back. But in general, the point is be mindful of the resources that you have coming in. If you cap out your authority, you should probably go take another region so that your authority can keep filling up again. Don't cap your resources unless. Play to your strengths. Learn about your enemies. The simple fact is there is a lot going on in this game. Each faction are rather asymm asymmetrical in a number of ways, and you're going to want to play every faction once or twice, at least against the AI, in order to get a feel for what they're trying to do and what they can do. If I'm playing the Atreides here, I don't want my game plan to be you know, domination. It is unlikely I'm going to go and kill everyone else's main base. I know that because the Atreides, they have a unique tech that replaces the tech that makes you do more damages against people's main base, right? Everybody else gets siege incentives that say you do 100% more damage to people's bases, but the Atreides do not. So Atreides are going to struggle mightily trying to burn down a main base while other people might not. Um, quick, uh, just a quick filter off the top of my head, your Atreides like you know, economic victories and expansion hegemony victories. The ECAS likewise, like uh, ex hegemony and and po politics. The Harkonnens and the Carino, they like money these days. Sometimes they like domination. They're good fighters. Sometimes they like um, they like a little bit of the Harkonnens like a little bit of assassination. The Carino like a little bit more of the domination side of things. If there's Vernius and smugglers, they're probably going to try to murder you at some point, right? You know, they're very strong assassin guys. So everyone's got their pros and their cons, and you really need to know about it to know how to deal with them, right? You could be friends with the smugglers, but they might stab you in the back at any moment, almost literally. Number seven. Uh, save your points of interest and use them to your advantage. Points of interest are these little uh, things that pop up around the map that you can send a guy to investigate or you could click on to investigate. Now, 
most of the time you're pretty safe to just go out and grab stuff that looks good, especially for the likes of developments, which you always kind of want to prioritize in that early and mid game. But there are a number of things you really want to keep in mind for maybe uh, special uses. Uh, um, think about our water cellar's caravan or our ruins here, where you could spend resources to get an influx in authority. Authority, a relatively hard to gain resource there. Um, I'm sitting capped out on authority right now. I certainly don't want don't want to take these now and have it go to waste. But imagine an end game scenario where you just need to have enough to cap that last region. Well, if you've got a couple of these laying around your empire in your back pocket and you could come in and you could grab them at the last second, you can surprise your enemies with, you know, a sudden influx of authority. Maybe you've kept uh, house gifts around and you could surprise your enemies with a sudden influx of influence for a really important vote. So be aware that a lot of these points of interest will have a, sort of an increased marginal utility, right, when you're depending on when you what point of the game that you're gonna you're gonna get them also a small little caveat the stuff that does developments um you know this says plus four days of a military development if i had a, a tech mostly researched for example uh insulated valley here is like three quarters of the way done if i got an econ tech you know um it would only fill up this insulated valley any extra tech doesn't overflow to the next one. So if you're 99% done with something in the econ tree, don't grab an econ development, finish out that tech so you don't waste it, and then grab the bonus econ development and it'll fill the next tech up the appropriate amount. Stuff won't overflow like that. But uh, points of interest, feel free to grab them, but keep an eye on important ones. Oh, also of note as well, I don't know if I see any at the moment, um, the ones that give you uh, uh, mercenaries. Stuff like this guy. You could spend some money to hire two extra troops for raids. The mercenaries don't count towards your command point total. So if you're about to get in a big, the big end game battle that's going to decide the game, it might be worthwhile to look around. Grab some of the mercenaries if they're still in your territory. Pay a little extra money for a couple extra troops. Might be enough to swing it. Uh, number nine. Very basic one. Siege hunting with scans. The humble probe set up. Keep an eye, sort of zoom out on your map from time to time and keep an eye if, uh, you know, raiders spawn from somewhere. I happened to see raiders spawn in this region earlier in the game, so I prepped myself a little probe scan, probe setup, and I dropped it on this region. Oh, look, there's a new siege. That's how you find sieges without having to uh, look for the points of interest that give you the real, re reveal a siege reward. You see guys coming out of a region, you drop a scan there. Be aware that sieges typically have to be on like the lower end of a rock wall. They're kind of built into the rocks like that. So if you've got a region that doesn't have any obvious lower ends of rock walls, it's probably less likely that there will be a siege there. Though I have seen sometimes you know, exceptions to that example. Number 10, the new rally points. Be aware that uh, the latest patch gave us this rally point option, which is super important um, militarily. Basically, if you have an airfield built anywhere, you get this circle, which I've turned on with my airfields filters here in the map, and you can set the rally point anywhere in that, in that region. So whenever you train guys, they will land at exactly that spot. Now that's useful for a number of reasons. It's mostly useful for defense. If you're about to get attacked and you have an airfield here and you're fighting feverishly over this point, make sure you're making guys as you're defending have the rally point right on top of your base, and as you make new guys, they'll drop right in on the fight. Um, if it's a close fight, that'll, that's enough to, to swing it there. Um, it, if, it's, if it's a long fight, maybe you, you pop your rally point a little bit further back, but you can still sort of rebuild on the edges and come back in when you get a chance. Rally points are really important. The likes of Fremen could stick rally points at neutral sieges. The Fremen could attack me in the back of my base and be making men that pop up right out of this siege right here. Super, super powerful. Be aware of rally points. We're going to move on to advanced tips. So maybe you've played the game, you've been around the block a few times, and you still want to know what's what. Well, number one for advanced tips, remember the charters. The way that you get political office is these charters get sort of randomly upvoted over time, and they get little number totals on them. And once, uh, once they have a high enough number total, there's a chance they'll show up as in the next Landsrad. You know, this the Eye of the Council is currently a 52 influence votes on it, so it's likely that the next time we have a Lanzarote Council, the eye 
the, of the eye of the council will show up in the Landsrat as a charter to vote for. Why is that important? Well, if you are pushing uh, politics, you've got maybe you've built triple blue buildings and you've got extra votes and you've got a lot of influence stocked up. Don't just let whatever show up and just see what you vote on it. Figure out what you're uh, what you're eligible for and put some spend some of your influence to upvote it. Right. Let's make sure Speaker of the Council comes up. That's critical. If you are pushing politics and you get Speaker of the Council, you're in a really good position to dictate further political action. Maybe the guy that you hate is doing really well in politics and he's about to be Speaker. He wants Speaker of the Council so he can do that sort of dictating of what's going on. Well, what you can do, even if you're not a particular, if you're not a powerhouse, you can come in here, you can say, oh, you know, the, the Atreides wants Speaker of the Council. I'm going to go ahead and spend my influence to upvote the I of the council. And if you've got enough influence to vote this higher than the speaker, maybe when he expected that to come up, suddenly this one comes up and it sets his political ambitions. You know, he wants to be the speaker of the council, but now you guys got to figure out who's going to be the water seller instead, right? Which is a much less impactful office. So you can kind of buy time. You can kind of delay and mislead what's going to go up. And you can do you can do these upvotes right up to the last second that the office that the lands red happens. So you can watch this little bar here of when the next lands red council is going to be sneaking here, upvote stuff that you that you want to come up, whether you want it to come up to f benefit from it yourself or whether you want it to come up to screw over someone else who wants something different. Um, also really important, if someone wins governorship, except for the ECAS, if they have their political arts development that prevents you from voting on it. If someone else wins doing governorship, even if they are the speaker of the council and they might be able to obstruct a loss of rights vote, you can come in here and you can upvote doing governorship to come up again at the very next council. You know, Fremen win doing governorship. No big deal. Everyone come in here, put your votes on this to make sure Dune governorship comes up again and just beat them at the second vote and they won't be the governor anymore. Uh, tip number 10, advanced tips. Be choosy in your expansion and identify the critical territories. Once you've got, um, once you've got the map a little bit explored, you need to be identifying what's the good, what are the good spots and not bothering or not wasting your time on the bad spots. Now, the easiest way to do that is to say the spice are the good spots, right? You want to look for where the spice fields are and you want to do some, you know, some early game calculus. Can you get there before the other guys get there and claim that spot for your own? There's definitely, you know, the defender's advantage in this game. If you're able to claim a spice field, they're going to have to spend an awful lot more time to kick you off of it than you had to spend to you know, claim it from the neutrals or whatever. So spice fields are your number one, your number one goal and target for just about everybody. The other thing is really special regions. Um, you know, the likes of these little stars that show up. By the way, I have um, the economic filter on, which is the I button, which shows you the wind, the resources, the specialness on top of all the stuff on the map. I highly recommend leaving that on. But boom, you can look at the map, look for these stars. The Well of Riches is a nice one. It's worth big money. You can uh, look over here. You could instantly see that this one down here is the desolation. No one can really get through that because it's a super, super bad desert. But you want to be looking. Um, take a look over here at the smugglers. They've got a big desert below them and a big desert above them. They need to have this critical middle territory here. If I come over as the Atreides and I grab this from them, that blocks them off from everything in the middle. It blocks them from being able to project their force towards other people. And all, you know, and maybe if I just have this defended, they can't even contest it necessarily. Also be aware on the map of villages that are very close together. Why is that good? Because you can have overlapping defenses. If Sand Lab here is right next to Heysud, we can build missile turrets on either side of the border right next to each other, and both of those missile turrets will defend the territory there. So villages that are close together can support each other militarily also, making it a much harder nut to, tr to crack for attacking guys. Um, number two, conceal your strength and your military and your money and look at the enemies, right? It's often a good t a good idea to have your guys not necessarily on the front lines, right? You don't want the smugglers to be able to look just look right over and count how many men you got. You know, you don't want them to say, "All right, there's, you know, the Trades have got five guys. I've got 10 guys. I'll walk over and murder them." 
if your men are kind of hidden out of their line of sight of, you know, maybe they're scouting thopters or maybe they're not scouting, they're just in, in the fog of war. If they can't see what you've got, they don't know. So they'll be less likely to come cause trouble with you. Or maybe they'll come cause trouble and they'll be way out of their league and you can go back and cause trouble to them because they've overextended. That sort of thing's really important. Likewise, you really want to be looking at your enemies. Just like you don't want your enemies to look at you too much, you want to keep an eye on them. You want to see, you know, does this guy have a big army? Are the smugglers building only snipers? If they are, maybe you want to build only melee, so you could just run in and tie up all those snipers in melee. You know, you you'll you'll learn eventually some some better unit counters kind of things and how how stuff that like that might work. But the information is the important part. You want to be able to see okay. what people have got, what people are doing. You fly up here, look, okay, we can see what they've got. You can even kind of take a look at their guys and see um, bonuses on them. Look, okay, so you can see the free company have taken ranged weapons in the armory. The scavengers have taken extra armor. You can see stuff like that. You, if you've got an idea of how many, you know, of basic power levels and hit points levels, you know, if you look at their guys and you say, wow, those wreckers have 360 health, that's a lot more than they normally have. They must have invested a lot into red stuff. Also of note, when you're looking at things, the faction screen here, once you build up intelligence levels, it reveals more information. Um, maybe one of the most important ones is intelligent level 1, which lets you see all production of reconned villages. I've got, a, I've got more than level 1 here, so I can just glance over at Vernius at any time and see what all of his villages are making. Again, because I've got the... the uh, economic filter on. I can just eyeball. I can see this village is making him 46 money. This village is making him 33 money. I can see where his most important lands are. If I want to hurt him, maybe I go and I try and pillage this, you know, the land on the border that's making the most money for him. That's also really important if you're playing with economic powerhouses. Think of uh, the Baron Harkonnen who's oppressing his spice fields. Maybe he got a really good array of traits. If you're able to look over and say, oh wow, this one spice field is making him 200 spice a day. Well, you need to go over there and blow that, burn that spice field down. 200 spice a day is, is an insane amount. You get That's land you got to fight for. That's strategic territory that I told you to identify earlier, you know. Really important. Make sure you are looking at your enemies and what they got as far as military goes. And also be aware that you can pop up this faction summony, summary, see people's hegemony, see their, their daily increase in hegemony, look at their chome shares. You can trade with people, oh, see what they've got for money, line. see what they've got for uh, Plascrete and Solarian things. How you can just keep, that? there's a lot of things you can look at to keep an eye on your, your enemies. And they could see what you've got if they put the effort in, but I'm telling you to put the effort in to see what they got first, right? You can't necessarily conceal everything you've got, but you can see what they've got for the most part. Uh, number three, plan your end game. You probably got, you should have some sort of idea of how you want to win. If I'm playing the Atreides, maybe I, I want to win with hegemony. Um, what does my end game look like? Especially once you start getting to the point where, uh, you know, the little notifications show up. Hey, Atreides have hit 20,000 hegemony, right? That's when everyone is going to take a look at you and they're going to sort of evaluate what you're capable of and whether they need to come kill you. So one really powerful thing you can do is have stuff in your back pocket. Anyone who's playing hegemony is going to keep regions that are uncontrolled um, in, you know, maybe this, maybe I never took this well of riches. I know a special region is going to contribute plus 1000 to my hegemony total. So I kind of, I kind of lay off of it and I don't pick it up. But as we're getting towards the end game, I could plan, I could look at my authority totals. All right, I'm going to annex this one because it's only 90. I'm going to annex this one next to it. It's only 63. And even this other one I've saved is only 70. These are real cheap. I can annex them all simultaneously and boom, that's a big chunk of hegemony boost. I can build my research center and it's going to give me he extra hegemony gains. Research centers also critically give you bonus to the... Um, a a retroactive bonus to the regions that you control. If I have 10,000 uh, hegemony worth of regions controlled, the second that I finish my research center, I get 
15% of that instantly as hegemony. So you can sort of make these things sort of coincide. We, we often call it the boom, you know, the hedge boom. I, I capture a bunch of things. I build my research center. Maybe I time that with when I pay my spice tax. All those things happen at once, and I jump from 24,000 hedge to 30,000 hedge and instantly win the game before people are able to come and jump on top of me. Maybe you're buying chome shares. Well, you probably want to lay off of the chome shares right about 39%. Why? Because when you hit 40%, it's going to pop up and say, Baron Harkonnen has 40% of the chome shares, and everybody in the lobby is going to come murder you. If you lay off of it and you bank your money, only someone who's paying close attention and looking to check your chome levels and then calling it out to the rest of the lobby is able to identify that. You'd rather have someone have to do that extra sleuthing than have the game just tell everyone it's time to come kill you. Bank your money up and then all at once turn on auto buy, buy all the possible shares, have a big bank so you could keep buying shares up. You know, make that final push a quick push. If your push towards victory is slow, people have a lot of time to stop it. So you want to have your push towards victory be as fast as you could possibly make it be. Um, let's see. Number five, watch your enemies. So this sort of goes back to that last one, which was, you know, keep an eye on the enemy's military and money. But be aware that you can also see what people are doing in the fog of war. And I don't have a good example for you currently in this game. But if the, uh, if the Fremen were pillaging this region, and this counts you know, all throughout the game, not just at the end game, but if the Fremen are over here pillaging, then I can see that pillage marker show up on the map. That tells me a bunch of things. That tells me the Fremen are not fighting their neighbors because they're just fighting neutrals. It tells me their army is right here on the map, probably, in case they've split up, which is possible, but a piece of their army is right here. Likewise, if they're annexing here, I know that they're expanding in this direction. If I look at the smugglers and they are annexing here and here and here, they're annexing a bunch of things at once, and maybe it's towards the end of the game, they might be right on the cusp of like a hedge boom, and I may have bare seconds or minutes in order to get over there and try to contest something or stop them from doing something. If a bunch, you know, the... One of the things that the Atreides are so, so powerful at is the, the power of the peaceful annexation because this is the one thing you can do that doesn't show up on the map. The Atreides could be peacefully annexing three or four regions at the end of the game and you don't know it till it's too late. So what do you do? You keep an eye on the Atreides and you say, all right, if I was Atreides, where would I be, you know, annexing? If the Atreides are, have 25,000 hedge and a whole bunch of unclaimed regions behind them, you need to, you know, mentally extrapolate, oh, they could just claim these regions and then they'd be at like 29,000 hedge and it would be the end of the game practically. We've got we've to gotta do something about that before they just do that thing that we can't really stop, you know. You've got to keep an eye on the map. Um, be aware you can see what's, you can see a lot of what's going on. Not only can you see annexing or pillaging or liberating, you can see operations that people throw down on the map. Um, if someone, if, the, if you see, you know, combat drugs and a supply drop up here, you could say, oh, these guys must be fighting each other. We could, I could see operations are going on up there. That might be a good time for you to go and push in on an undefended flank and take something from someone. Um, okay, what do we got? What's next? Number seven. No. Number six. Play the terrain. Be aware that the terrain can be a pretty big factor in a lot of fights. Let's take this little village here, Codval, for instance. If people want to attack Codval, well, look, you can't get into it from the north. There's a walkway up over here. There's a walkway up over the, the, the left side in the desert. If someone wants to walk up into here to take this region, they'd need to walk through my main base, which would be virtually impossible, or extremely dangerous, rather. And if I had some ranged units the whole time, I could be up here, I could be shooting some of their guys, kind of wearing them down, when they can't really get up here to contest it. Also, if someone was coming in through the desert, you know, if they're going to have to traverse through the deep desert, you can, you know, make the, uh, you know, move your men to kind of body block the way in. Try to force them to stand in the dead, the deep desert as long as possible. It'll call worms onto them. It'll, it'll get rid of their supply. There's a lot of little things you could do to make the terrain work in your favor. If they've got to walk up through the mountains, well, the mountains only allow these sort of narrow walkways through them. If you've got a, a, a larger ranged force, you want to get in here and you want to kind of clog up these walkways with troops and then use your ranged guys to focus down people that get stuck in the mountains. If you've got a heavy melee force, 
you don't want to fight in the mountains. You might need to backtrack and find another way in because you, you're not going to be able to get through. Only a couple of your guys can fight at a time. You know, people tend to have this habit of, you know, you select all your men, you go and attack the guys. They select all their men, they come and attack you. But a lot of fights are really dependent by... Or uh, really depend on the engagement, you know. Were all your men close together and they started shooting? Were their men sort of strung out because they had to walk around these various cliffs and not everyone engaged at the same time, so you got picked off piecemeal? There's a lot of stuff about just where people are standing and what the ground looks like. If there's a big desert between, like, look up here, if, if, there, if someone wanted to attack you from the north, if there's, you know, barons up here and you're down here and they want to take this land from you, that will be so difficult for them to do because they need to walk through all this desert, then they get into your lands and they get to walk through all this desert. That is both a lot of time that they're losing supply, that is a lot of time that a worm could pop up and attack them. You could wait till they're part of the ways across and then drop a thumper on them, which is gonna call a worm real soon, and suddenly they're in a real bad position. Do they continue on, maybe get half their army eaten by a worm and then get killed by your guys as they try to get onto the rocks? Do they turn around and run back while they've wasted all this time and supply? There's just a lot of, a lot of things to keep in mind there. The terrain can be really, really important with fights especially just walking distances and things like that can really change the way that you're going to play the game. You know, this place I would say is for most intents and purposes, not attackable from this other Northern place. There's too much distance between them, too much open sand. That's really dangerous to cross. Uh, number seven, make deals, but be aware of the consequences. Uh, w you do oh, want to be trading with people. You do want to make you want to make some non-aggression packs. You want to throw out trade agreements, political agreements, research agreements. Why do you do that? Because it's a four-player game. When you trade with someone, you and the other player are both getting stronger, and the two players who have not traded with you are not getting stronger. So the more trade deals you have, the more benefit you are getting over the rivals you're not trading with. Now where to be careful with that is, you don't want to be trading into people who are maybe going to get more advantage from that than you are, right? If the Baron Harkonnen is choming up a storm, he's making a ton of money, and you're poor, you don't want to go in there and give him an extra three Solari per villages and three Solari production. Maybe it would help you for being poor, but it would help him even more because he's going to he's gonna be able to leverage that to buy even extra, extra chome than he was already doing. You're just pushing him towards his win condition for some minor benefits for you, right? Don't make political agreements with, you know, ECAS if they're about to push governor. They don't need the extra influence. I will say research agreement is just about always good for everybody. You should make more research agreements probably. Also be aware that you can trade stuff um, for people. It's good to have short-term friendships in in uh, in Spice Wars, right? I mean, anytime you make deals with people, they think a little better about you, right? If you have been trading, you know, if you traded some gold for some plascrete with the smugglers, the smugglers are a little less likely to come murder you. That's just how humans work. They don't want to, human beings don't want to beat up other human beings that have been nice to them, right? Um, and the likes of plascrete trades are often very valuable too. If you are not making a lot of plascrete, and you, you know, you dearly want that plascrete in order to build out your village, but you're only making 80 a day, and it's going to take you two months to get enough to build out the village. Well, it's probably a really good opportunity to look at your neighbors and say, all right, this guy's got a bunch of plascrete. Maybe I can make a deal here. Maybe he'll send me you know, 700 plascrete, and I'll offer him, usually you sort of a two-to-one kind of trade deal. I'll give him $2,000, he can give me 700 plascrete. Now that, on the surface, $2,000 for 700 plascrete maybe doesn't sound like a great deal, but if you just can't get the plascrete and 700 plascrete suddenly allows you to build, you know, two major buildings and another harvester that you were waiting on, that can be a really, really big benefit to make those kind of early game deals be totally free to be able to send people intel or influence. If you are in the midst of, of assassinating the biggest, baddest player in the lobby, but your intel is running low, tell your friends. Say, hey, smugglers, you know? You know, pull up pull up your chat your chat wheel, send a private message to the smugglers, say, hey, you know, I need more intel to murder this guy. Will you just give it to me? And oftentimes people will do that, you know? Don't be afraid of making deals. Making deals is important. But try not to make deals that are going to push people towards their own win conditions, right? You want, you want you both people to benefit from the deal, but you don't want them to benefit more than you, right? Uh, number eight, 
mind the tempo. Um, so tempo is a thing that we talk about in a lot of types of strategy games where it's the it's sort of this ephemeral idea of the speed and the flow of the game. Uh, new players playing the game often have a low tempo. They're going to be sort of slower to get things up. They're going to be, you know, they're going to hit the timings of when they have their full army different than a, you know, a, a good player. Good players will, will do things faster. So be aware of sort of the flow of things and where you feel like you are or where your enemies look like they are in the tempo. If everybody's at 10k hege hegemony, but one guy's at 20k hedge, he is so far ahead in the tempo, you know, what is he doing? Does he have a huge military and he's able to just stomp on people? Is he going to be able to boom, you know, on the way to victory before anyone else can really get to him? You know, if it's another thought about tempo is, you know, if it's month three, nobody's getting assassinated in month three, right? Because it takes time to set these things up and get these things. So you can sort of feel safe you know, for the first couple of months because no one's going to assassinate you. You don't need stuff on, you don't need your agents put on counterintelligence because, you know, at the, the pace of, the, of where the game is at, you're not expecting these things to happen. But, you know, conversely, if you can get something out ahead of tempo, if you've got an assassination attempt set up in the third or fourth month, people are probably not ready for that. You could probably kill someone when they've got nobody on counterintelligence. Um, likewise, militarily, if you've got enough money to fund a big military, if you've gone deep into the red tree giving you extra command points, your military tempo may be well ahead of other people's, so you can use that advantage to go and fight them before they have time to catch up to you, right? You know, think of, you know, if you gave everybody 10 months to build everything they wanted, everybody would be probably about equal. They would have the same size militaries, they would have big economies, they would have lots of lands. But if you can do those things ahead of the average speeds or, you know, identify other people that are running ahead of the average speeds, you can use that information to your advantage, either to press the advantage or to try to, you know, call it out to the lobby and slow people down when they're getting ahead. Uh, likewise with the tempo, uh, advanced tip number nine is exploit your timings. So if you are building three red buildings in your main base, once you do so, you'll have 20% more max health on your military units. If you get in a fight before those buildings are done, you don't have that max health. But as soon as that's done, you could go and get in a fight with someone else who is maybe a little slower, right? Likewise with the tempo, if you hit these timings, boom, you, your three red buildings are done, go fight somebody. Why? Because the chances are decent that their three red buildings are not done. If you're, if you're, you know, as soon as something gets built, wait, wait till you hit the timing, right? Rather, before you do something. If you want to go fight the smugglers, get that military base built up on the borders. Don't run in and fight them yet. Build your military base, and the second, or you know, maybe a couple seconds before it's done, you run in and fight because suddenly it is a shift of the power. Right when your military base gets done, you're stronger than you were, you know, a second before. Right when you hit some military districts, or maybe right when you research technology, maybe right when you buy some unlock new stuff in the armory, you suddenly have made a jump in power above what your neighbor is likely to do or have. Um, they will catch up to you eventually. If you get up to 65 C command points of your army and you just sit there, well, eventually your neighbor is going to get up to 65 command points of their army and then you'll be at parity again and you don't have that advantage. If you hit 65 and you go and you fight him while he's only got 40 command points of an army, you're going to crush him. And he needs time in order to research those technologies and build those men. So you've got that timing window of where you can do stuff that, other, that you will have advantages over your rivals. Last tip, number five, be a goldfish. No blood feuds in, the, in this game. This is a four-player free-for-all. If you have been feuding with the, with the smugglers over the same piece of territory the entire game, you curse him and his entire bloodline, you hate this person to the very depths of your soul. Well, as soon as the guy across the map is about to win on hegemony or chome or wins a governor position or something that is big and irreversible that requires your attention, you need to make friends with your eternal rival and go kill that other guy, right? Holding a feud, holding a grudge does you no favors in this game. There are four players, so your worst enemy may need to be your best friend tomorrow. 
And you can go back to being worst enemies eventually, but you know, for the time being, you need to you need to always be willing to make your enemies your friends for the short term. And always expect that your friends could turn into enemies. You know, if you've had a peaceful border with these guys the whole game, they may be about to stab you in the back. And that's okay, that's just business. If they try and stab you in the back and they fail, well, maybe you gotta be friends with them again because you gotta deal with the other guys, right? It is no good whatsoever holding a feud in this game. You play in to win, and to win, you gotta make friends with people until you don't. Those are my basic tips, those are my advanced tips. 20-ish, who was counting? Hope you guys like this, hopefully that's useful to you. Comments down below. Again, I tried making a, a, a how to play guide and it just didn't work, so we might do more tips and tricks as they come to the mind, or uh, we'll, we'll figure it out. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, thanks for watching, guys, and I will see you in the next one. Take care.